Darwin's Doubt, Part 10. We've been reviewing the uh, book Darwin's Doubt by Stephen C. Meyer, PhD, author of Signature in the Cell, was originally an oil ge industry geophysicist, which we'll run into a little bit more here, uh, then got his PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science. Uh, so the discussion that he's having is, um, is where his training is. Uh, he is currently the director for the Center for Science and Culture in um, the Discovery Institute. And uh, the book is, in fact, a massive expansion of Meyer's article, The Origin of Biological Information and the Higher Taxonomic Categories. Um, the, uh, the work that uh, got uh, Richard Sternberg into trouble. There's the cover of the book itself. The book, according to the prologue, is divided into three main parts. Part one, the mystery of the missing fossils. Part two, how to build an animal. And part three, after Darwin, what? And um, we're into the middle of part three. The story so far, um, Meyer has argued, and I think coherently, that the sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin. And the problem has only grown worse with the discovery of first the Burgess Shale and then the Chengjiang fossils. The excuse that the precursors were soft-bodied and therefore not preserved has been refuted by the evidence. The claims that intermediates are really there are lacking evidence and not believed by most authorities, even though they're sometimes popularly put out. Genetics seems to demand intermediate if common descent is assumed. And so if they're not there and genetics demands them, then that suggests that there's a problem with the theory. The tree of life cannot be used as a counterbalance to the problem of the Cambrian explosion because it has its own problems and punctuated equilibrium cannot explain the Cambrian explosion either. Um, the reason why the Cambrian explosion is a challenge for Darwinism is that Darwinism has to explain the origin of massive amounts of information, not just Shannon information, uh, ones and zeros, but functional information, ones and zeros that do something. Actually, be precise, A, T, G, and C that does something. There's always been doubt that Darwinism was up to the job, but the work of Yaki, Sauer, and now Axe have made the job much more daunting. Steve Meyer, after one of Axe's more important works, wrote a paper that called attention to the work of Axe, only to see the paper put on a figurative index and Richard Sternberg to be effectively excommunicated, and not to have started a uh, a uh, commentary within the uh, peer-reviewed literature at all, or a uh, conversation. The only paper to attempt an answer to Meyer's article was an internet article, and uh, Meyer takes that article apart, showing that the article's main peer-reviewed support doesn't say what the article says it says. New developments in population genetics have made more clear the magnitude of the barriers to getting even small changes in DNA that are advantageous, especially in multicellular animals, and I would say especially, well, especially in critical uh, uh, parts of the animal. Developmental gene regulatory networks, which can't change significantly without damaging or killing the creature, but must change to give rise to a new body plan, and epigenetic information also challenged Darwinism. That's part two, and then part three, what we covered last week was that several modifications of or alternatives to Darwinian theory have been proposed, such as self-organization, evo-devo, neutral ev evolution, Leo Lamarckianism, and natural genetic engineering. Each of these has weaknesses, and perhaps the most profound common weakness is the inability to explain the origin of specified complexity or information in what I would call the higher sense. And so 
We have come to part three after Darwin, what and the possibility of intelligent design. Steve Meyer starts out the, um, the chapter by saying the owner of a remote island estate has been murdered while out riding. When the local sheriff arrives, he learns that there are several obvious suspects, the volatile gamekeeper, the owner of a neighboring estate with whom the murder victim has had a long running feud, and the, estate's owners, the estate owner's estranged wife, who has been living on the island in a small mother-in-law cottage. The sheriff quickly learns the basic facts of the case. The victim was found dead, face down on the beach, with his horse standing nearby. Any one of the three suspects could have taken a rifle from an unlocked shed at the end, uh, edge of the property. All were healthy enough to have hiked to the scene of the crime. Each of them had a motive, and none has an alibi. But as the investigation unfolds, additional facts come to light. Most importantly, when the coroner arrives, he determines that although the victim was shot in the stomach and then his head was harshly bludgeoned by the butt of the rifle, these injuries served merely to conceal the bullet wound that actually killed the estate owner. The man was dead when he hit the ground. What killed him was a perfect shot entering the head just behind the right ear, exactly where an expert marksman would place a bullet. Moreover, ballistics show that this bullet came from a different gun altogether from the one stored in the shed, a weapon likely fired from quite a distance. The sheriff then returns to the list of suspects and one by one eliminates them. Abundant evidence shows that none of the three prime suspects is a particularly good shot, much less a world-class marksman. The landowner's estranged wife has a shaky hand and no experience with firearms. The volatile gamekeeper has extremely poor eyesight. And the neighboring landowner turns out to have an alibi after all, as well as a broken arm, which would have prevented him from holding the kind of rifle from which the bullet was fired. There is, however, one other person living on the estate, though not even the other, other suspects suspect him. He is the victim's loyal and longtime personal assistant, a timorous older man much beloved by both the family and the other servants. No one wants to consider him as a possible suspect, but is it possible that he could have had something to do with the crime after all? Might an unex unexpected suspect, indeed the butler, have done it? Clearly, standard evolutionary theory has reached an impasse. Neither neo-Darwinism nor a host of more recent proposals, punctuated equilibrium, self-organization, evolutionary developmental biology, neutral evolution, epigenetic inheritance, natural genetic engineering, have succeeded in explaining the origin of the novel animal forms that arose in the Cambrian period. Yet all these evolutionary theories have two things in common. They rely on strict material processes. And they also have failed to identify a cause capable of generating the information necessary to produce new forms of life. This raises a question. Is it possible that a different or unexpected kind of cause might provide a more adequate explanation for the origin of new form and information, as well as other distinctive features present in the Cambrian explosion? In particular, is it possible that intelligent design the purposeful action of a conscious and rational agent might have played a role in the Cambrian explosion. Introducing intelligent design. When the case for intelligent design is made, it's often hard to get contemporary evolutionary biologists to see why such an idea should even be considered or why discussion of design should play any role in biology at all. Though many biologists now acknowledge serious deficiencies in current strictly materialistic theories of evolution, they resist considering the alt alternatives that involve intelligent guidance, direction, or design. Much of this resistance seems to come simply from not understanding what the theory of intelligent design is. Many evolutionary biologists see intelligent design as a religiously based idea, a form of biblical creationism. Others think the theory denies all forms of evolutionary change. But contrary to media reports, intelligent design is not a biblical, biblically based idea, but instead an evidence-based theory about life's origins, one that challenges some, but not all, meanings of the term evolution. 
Perhaps the best way to explain the theory of intelligent design is to contrast it with a specific aspect of the theory of Darwinian evolution that it directly challenges. Recall from our opening discussion in chapter one that the term evolution has many different meanings and that Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection affirmed several of them. First, change over time. Second, universal common descent. And third, the creative power of natural selection acting on random variations. In affirming this third meaning of evolution, both classical Darwinism and modern neo-Darwinism also affirm what neo-Darwinist Richard Dawkins has called the blind watchmaker hypothesis. This hypothesis holds that the mechanism of natural selection acting on random genetic variations and mutations, uh, mutations are just one form of the variations that can happen, can produce not just new biological form and structure, but also the appearance of design in living organisms. Darwin argued for this idea in The Origin of Species as well as in his letters. Recall the sheep breeding illustration from chapter one where I described how both intelligent human breeders and environmental change, a series of bitterly cold winters, might produce an adaptive advantage in a population of sheep. During the 19th century, biologists regarded the adaptation of organisms to their environment as one of the most powerful pieces of evidence of design in the living world. By observing that natural selection had the power to produce such adaptations, Darwin not only affirmed that his mechanism could generate significant biological change, but that it could explain the appearance of design without invoking the activity of an actual designing intelligence. In doing so, he sought to refute the design hypothesis by proving a materialistic explanation for the origin of apparent design in living organisms. By observing that natural selection had the power to produce such adaptations, Darwin not only affirmed that his mechanism could generate significant biological change, but that it could explain the appearance of design without invoking the activity of an actual designing intelligence. In doing so, he sought to refute the design hypothesis by providing a materialistic explanation for the origin of apparent design in living organisms. As the late Harvard evolutionary biologist Ernst Meyer explains, the real core of Darwinism is the theory of natural selection. This theory is so important for the Darwinian because it permits the explanation of adaptation, the design of the natural theologian by natural means. Or as another prominent evolutionary biologist, Francisco Ayala, Ayala has put it succinctly, natural selection explains design without a designer. Other contemporary neo-Darwinian biologists, including Richard Dawkins, Francis Crick, and Richard Lewontin, have also emphasized that biological organisms only appear to have been designed. And this note is rich enough that I'm pulling it up into the main body for now. As Dawkins notes, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a, pur a purpose. That's the first page of The Blind Watchmaker. Crick likewise explains, organisms appear as if they had been designed to perform in an astonishingly efficient way, and the human mind therefore finds it hard to accept that there, there need be no designer to achieve this. Uh, I want you to notice here that these are all people who are saying that apparent design is all throughout nature. You see, the main purpose of evolutionary biology is to explain the appearance of design. <coughs> and then Lewontin also observed that living organisms appear to have been carefully and artfully designed. Remember that the next time somebody tells you that uh, there's only a negative argument for intelligent design. There's obviously a positive argument. The problem is uh, that they don't want to admit that. And uh, just to add my own uh, finding of uh, George Gaylord Simpson, who said, 
A telephone, uh, pardon me, a telescope, a telephone, or a typewriter is a complex mechanism serving a particular function. Obviously, its manufacturer had a purpose in mind, and the machine was designed and built in order to serve that purpose. An eye, an ear, or a hand is also a complex mechanism serving a particular function. It, too, looks as if it had been made for a purpose. This appearance of purpose purposefulness is pervasive in nature. So I think the, the point can be fairly made that the argument, the positive argument for design is clearly uh, there. And so if you ever hear somebody saying, well, design, uh, intelligent design is just a negative argument, they're wrong. They're wrong by all of the lights of the um, uh, of evolution. I mean, look at the list. George Gaylord Simpson, Richard Dawkins, Francis Crick, Richard Lewontin, Ernst Meyer, Franci uh, Francisco Ayala. The list goes on. Dawkins has noted, for example, that the digital information in DNA bears an uncanny resemblance to the computer software or machine code. He explains that many aspects of living systems quote, give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Of course, that's the blind watchmaker. Nevertheless, neo-Darwinists re regard that appearance of design as entirely illusory, as did Darwin himself, because they think that pure, mindless, materialistic processes such as natural selection and random mutations can produce the intricate, design-like structures in living organisms which means that if purely mindless materialistic processes can't do that, then you have a positive argument for design and a negative argument against the alternatives. That's where the theory of intelligent design comes into play. Intelligent design challenges the idea that natural selection and random mutation and other, least, other similarly undirected materialistic processes can explain the most striking appearances of design in living organisms. Instead, it affirms that there are certain features of living s systems, not all, but certain ones, that are best explained by the design of an actual intelligence, a conscious and rational agent, a mind, as opposed to a mindless materialistic process. The theory of intelligent design does not reject evolution, defined as change over time, nor even universal common ancestry, but it does dispute Darwin's idea that the cause of major biologic change and the appearance of design are wholly blind and undirected. Again, that's the Reader's Digest version. If you see ellipses, uh, places where I'm skipping stuff. Either life arose as the result of purely undirected material processes or a guiding or designing intelligence played a role. Advocates of intelligent design favored the latter option and argued that living organisms look designed because they really were designed. Design proponents argued that living systems exhibit telltale indicators of prior intelligent activity that justify this claim, indicators that make intelligent design scientifically detectable from the evidence of the living world. But that, for many evolutionary biologists, is precisely the rub. Because they think of intelligent design as a religiously based idea, they understand that people might want to affirm intelligent design of life as part of their religious beliefs, but not as a consequence of scientific evidence. Indeed, most evolutionary biologists don't see how the idea of intelligent design could contribute to a scientific explanation of life's origins, nor do they see how intelligent design could ever be detected or inferred scientifically from evidence in nature. Exactly how would researchers justify such an inference? And uh, then Steve Meyer talks about his personal story. When I left for my graduate st uh, studies in England in 1986, I was asking a similar set of questions. At that time, I wasn't thinking about the scientific legitimacy of the intelligent design hypothesis as an explanation for the origin of animals. Instead, I wanted to know if intelligent design could help explain the origin of life itself. And 
we went over the book that he wrote, Signature in the Cell. My questions eventually led me to learn about a distinctive method of historical scientific inquiry. That discovery led me to a method of reasoning that allows for the detection or inference of past causes, including intelligent causes. In 1985, I had met uh, chemist Charles Thaxon, who wrote The Mystery of Life's Origin, with co-authors polymer scientists and engineer Walter Bradley and the geochemist Roger Olson. But it was in the book's epilogue that the three scientists proposed a radical alternative. There they suggested that the information-bearing properties of DNA might point to the activity of a designing intelligence, to the work of a mind, or an intelligent cause, as they put it. Thaxton argued that scientists might propose an intelligent cause as a positive scientific explanation for some events in the past, as part of a special mode of scientific inquiry called origin science. He noted that scientific disciplines such as archaeology, evolutionary biology, cosmology, and paleontology often infer the occurrence of singular, non-repeatable events, and that the method, methods used to make such inferences could help scientists identify positive indicators of intelligent causes in the past as well. Here, I wasn't initially so sure. So the next year, when I left Dallas, Texas for Cambridge, England, to pursue my studies in the history and philosophy of science, I had a lot on my mind. Is there a distinctive method of historical uh, scientific inquiry. By the way, uh, history and philosophy of science often go together for the simple reason that the philosophy of science is usually based on the history of science. Um, is there a distinctive method of historical scientific inquiry? If so, does that method of reasoning and investigation justify a scientific reformulation of the design hypothesis? In particular, does the intuitive connection between information and the prior activity of a designing intelligence justify positive, historical, scientific inference to intelligent design? Does it make intelligent design detectable? Historical scientific method and the design hypothesis. In my research, I discovered that historical scientists often do make inferences with a distinctive logical form. This type of inference is known technically as an abductive inference, uh, which can be distinguished from two better known forms, inductive and deductive reasoning. And we'll give some illustrations here. Inductive argument will be A1 is B, A2 is B, A3 is B, A4 is B, A however many, N is B, and you know, you draw the conclusion eventually all A's are B. Um, a deductive argument is more of a major premise if A has occurred, then B follows as a matter of course. Minor premise, A has occurred. And conclusion, hence B will follow as well. You know, the old familiar, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. The abductive argument is a little bit different. It starts out, if A occurs, then B would be expected as a matter of course. The minor premise is the surprising fact, otherwise surprising fact, of B is observed. And the conclusion is that there is reason to suspect that A has occurred. Now you'll notice that this is not an absolute, it's not like the deductive one. If you got the deductive one right, um, then if the major premise and the minor premise are true, then the conclusion is as true as the major premise and minor premise. In an abductive argument, basically you're going backwards and so you can't say that for sure. All you can say is there's reason to suspect that A occurred. For example, a geologist might reason as follows. Major premise, if a mudslide occurred, we would expect to find felled trees. We find evidence of felled trees. Therefore, we have reason to think that a mudslide may have occurred. Now, of course, it's obvious that that's not absolute. 
In the deductive form, if the premises are true, the conclusion follows with certainty. The logic of the abductive arguments is different, however. Abductive arguments do not produce certainty, but merely instead plausibility or possibility. To see why, consider the following variation of the preceding abductive argument. Major premise, if a mudslide has occurred, we expect to find felled trees. Minor premise, we find felled trees. Conclusion, therefore, a mudslide occurred. Well, that's a little too vigorous. Notice that unlike the first version of the abductive argument, in which the conclusion was stated tentatively, we have reason to think a mudslide may have occurred. In this version, the conclusion is affirmed definitively. A mudslide occurred, period. Obviously, this latter form of argument has a problem. It does not follow that because the trees have fallen, a mudslide necessarily occurred. The trees may have fallen for some other reason. A hurricane may have blown them down. Perhaps an ice storm occurred and the trees fell under the weight of accumulating ice. Or loggers may have cut them down. In logic, affirming the consequent variable of a minor premise with certainty constitutes a formal fallacy, which is true. A fallacy that derives from the failure to acknowledge that more than one cause or antecedent might produce the same evidence or consequent. Even so, the presence of downed timber might indicate that a mudslide has occurred, thus amending the above argument to conclude we have reason to think that a mudslide may have occurred does not commit a fallacy. It's the difference between evidence and demonstration. Even if we may not affirm the consequent with certainty, we can affirm it as a possibility. This is precisely what abductive reasoning does. It provides a reasoning for considering the hypothesis and often a hypothesis about the past may be true. Even if one cannot affirm the hypothesis or conclusion with certainty. In fact, uh, it's arguable that all hypotheses about the past are of that nature. The method of multiple competing hypotheses. To address this limitation in abductive reasoning and to make it possible to strengthen inferences about the past, the 19th century geologist uh, Thomas Chamberlain, notice he's a geologist, um, developed a form of reasoning he called the method of multiple working hypotheses. Historical and forensic scientists employ this method when more than one cause or hypothesis can account for the same evidence. They use it to adjudicate between competing hypotheses by comparing them to see which one best explains not just one piece of evidence, but usually a wider class of relevant facts. Uh, he gives the example of continental drift. Um, uh, first of all, South America and Africa fit together. Secondly, fossil forms discovered on the east coast of South America match those on the west coast of Africa in corresponding places in sedimentary strata. The migration of flora and fauna acro either across oceans or over ancient land bridges was offered as a counter-argument. Um, but what really kind of sealed the deal was that during World War II, the United States Navy surveyed the seafloor to topography and measured the Earth's magnetic field across the oceans. These magnetic surveys showed parallel stripes of magnetized rock, each with the same polarity on either side of the mountain ridges, running down the middle of the ocean floor at equal distances from the mid-oceanic mountain ranges. Geologists also learned that magma was continually seeping out at the middle of these mid-oceanic mountain ranges. And I'm going to show you figure 17.2 and this is the kind of thing that that made them decide if you if you were to look at the magnetic polarity you would notice that that the changes were very similar um, on both sides and also uh, in widely different areas so that it, there appeared to be parallel uh, lines of magnetic um, uh, residual, uh, residual magnetism left in the uh, in the lava what they apparently have called piano keys. And we have one person here who lived through that uh, um, revolution. Obviously, 
saying the best explanation is the one that best explains the facts or best explains the most facts begs an important question. What does it mean to explain something well or best? As it happens, historical scientists have developed criteria for deciding which explanation among a group of competing possible hypotheses provides the best explanation for some event in the remote past. The most important of these criteria is causal adequacy. As a condition of formulating a successful explanation, a historical scientist must identify causes that are known to have the power to produce the kind of effect, feature, or event in question. One of the first historical scientists to develop the criterion of causal adequacy was the geologist Charles Lyell in The Principles of Geology. The subtitle of Lyell's book summarized his central methodological principle, being an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. Lyell argued that when scientists seek to explain events in the past, they should not invoke some unknown type of cause, the effects of which we have not observed. Instead, they should cite causes that are known from our uniform experience to have the power to produce the effect in question. Now, of course, Lyell also argued that they had to be in the same um, general, of the same general power as the effects that we now see in question. And that part of Lyell's work has kind of disappeared. Then there's something uh, that's called the only known cause. And for the physicians among you, you've probably heard of it as a pathognomonic finding. That is, it's a finding for which only one disease will cause that particular symptom or cluster of symptoms. Both philosophers of science and leading historical scientists have emphasized causal adequacy as the key criterion by which competing hypotheses are judged. But philosophers of science have insisted that assessments of explanatory power lead to conclusive inferences only when there is just one known cause for the effect or evidence. You have this symptom, you have to have this disease, period, whatever else happens. Logically, if a postulated cause is known to be a necessary condition or cause of a given event or effect, then historical scientists can validly infer that condition or cause from the presence of the effect. If it's true that where there is smoke, there is always fire first, then the presence of smoke wafting up over a distant mountain range decisively indicates the prior, ind prior presence of a fire on the other side of the ridge. Of course, if you can have smoke without fire, then um, it doesn't positively indicate. You may have one of the other causes of smoke. Historical inference and intelligent design. What does all this have to do with the Cambrian explosion? Quite a lot. In my investigation of the historical scientific method, I found that whether they always realize it or not, historical scientists typically use the method of inference to the best explanation. In fact, this is a major separation between experimental science and historical science. They make abductive inferences about past causes from present clues, evidence, or effects. This later suggested to me that if there were features of the Cambrian explosion, the Cambrian animals, that would be expected as a matter of course, if an intelligent designer had played a role in that event, then it was at least possible to formulate the hypothesis of intelligent design as his historical or abductive scientific inference. An advocate of intelligent design could reason in a standard historical scientific way. Major premise, if intelligent design played a role in the Cambrian explosion, then feature X, known to produce by intelligent activity, would be expected as a matter of course. Perhaps feature X is long strings of ordered DNA. Um, minor premise, feature X is observed in the Cambrian explosion of animal life. Conclusion, hence there is reason to suspect that an intelligent cause played a role in the Cambrian explosion. And that can be strengthened by the observation, is there anything else that can produce those same long strings of DNA that are specified as to their effect? Of course, a historical scientist 
would only be justified in making such an abductive inference to the past activity of an intelligent agent if feature X is evident in the Cambrian explosion and if intelligent design is known to produce feature X. Moreover, just because the Cambrian explosion may exhibit some feature or features for which intelligent design is a known cause does not mean that intelligent design was necessarily the actual cause or the best explanation of those features. Only if the Cambrian event and animals feat exhibit features for which intelligent design is the only known cause may a historical scientist make a deci decisive inference to a past intelligent cause. We are left with two crucial questions. Are there in fact such features present in the record of the Cambrian explosion or the animals that arise in it? Features that are known from our experience to be produced by intelligent causes such that they would justify making a tentative abductive inference to intelligent design. Are there also perhaps features of the Cambrian ex event that are known from our experiences to be produced by intelligent causes and only intelligent causes, justifying a more definitive inference to past intelligent activity as the best explanation for the relative, relevant in, in evidence. Might the butler have done it after all? And that is where the chapter ends. Uh, my own take on this is that Steve Meyer gives a good philosophical discussion of geological reasoning. The discussion uh, inadvertently illustrates why historical science is different from experimental science. Abductive reason is not, not one that is commonly used, uh, or at least certainly not in the definitive way it is in uh, historical science, uh, in uh, experimental science. And the other thing is Steve Weyer illustrates the proper use of abductive reasoning in the weak form and also in two stronger forms, um, which is it's the best explanation and it's the only explanation for certain features. Dr. Meyer is preparing us for the next chapter entitled Signs of Design in the Cambrian Explosion. And we'll see that next week. And uh, I will just note, uh, although we've noted it already, that a pathognomonic finding permits strict deduction as well, at least as strict as can be, can be done in science. Um, and I think that the theoretical reasons for choosing, the, uh, uh, choosing to use the intelligent design as a, a partial explanation for the Cambrian explosion is actually um, logical from a standard scientific perspective. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. We could take several approaches to uh, <clears throat> this situation that we find ourselves in. And uh, one of the common comments always made about intelligent design, that is not science. Uh, science has, at least uh, recently, defined itself out of the possibility of a designer. We like, we like science, we like it, it's objective, uh, and it, uh, good hard data is impressive. Uh, as practice, science doesn't stick to that, but it tends to define itself when it meets the intelligent design issue. Uh, one approach would be to point out the limitations of such an approach. Another one would be to try and redefine science. Uh, either one of them would be useful. Uh, for one thing, if you're going to say that uh, science is, uh, needs to be redefined. Uh, you can fall back on the historical definition of uh, at least what natural philosophers did and so on, and very clearly 
when the foundations of modern science were laid down, this was done in, in a, uh, an environment of intelligent design. Uh, Newton, Pascal, Boyle, uh, Galileo, uh, and so on. So these all were recognizing God as a designer and the laws that made science possible were laws that God had created. He was the creator of science. And science could work very well in that, and these folks developed very much our basic principles in, along that particular approach. Uh, and uh, science then narrowed itself down into a naturalistic uh, philosophy and excluded God. And now we, yeah, you can't, uh, you can't uh, teach about intelligent design in a science class. That's not science. It was science when science was established. Science can work very well in that environment. It doesn't now by arbitrary definition. Uh, so we, we've got that, uh, th that issue right there. That, uh, and, uh, But we could also point out, and another approach would be to uh, point out how Science has constrained itself into this uh, box, uh, logically very hard to defend. Why limit your horizon of possibilities? If you want to find truth, you ought to be open uh, to other ideas and so on. I don't know which argument would be most useful here, but uh, I do think that there's plenty of room for arguing uh, that the present restricted approach of science is certainly no way to find out truth. What if God exists? There's no way to. Uh, and you try explaining everything without God, you're essentially stating there is no God. And you're getting into, of course, philosophy and religion when you do that. Go ahead. You're next. Thank you for um, a uh, very clear and, and uh, easily understandable exposition of um, the probably one of the foremost thinkers in the field of intelligent design. I think um, this particular chapter is, I don't get here very often, but I'm glad I got here for this one because I like it. And I think that it, um, it does an excellent job of explaining tentative possibilities that should be considered. And I would agree with uh, Dr. Roth in the fact that the fact that they're not considered is a deficiency probably because of um, a concern that if they were, the scientists who did that would be viewed as weak need. What um, I am a bit uh, surprised about, though, is that um, in terms of where we stand as an Adventist church, this whole uh, field of intelligent design, it seems to me, if followed through, um, would eliminate the possibility of flood geology as having had any significant effect on the world that we see. Certainly these people would not, um, as near as I understand them, would not accept it. So I guess my question is, how do we in terms of where we've come from and where we find ourselves at the moment, as at the moment we're sponsoring uh, GRI, which is a, an organization that is, um, was built on the notion that flood geology uh, could explain much of the scientific evidence in the world. If we go down the road of intelligent design, and I'm very comfortable with much of what was said here, um, are we going to abandon flood geology? And if so, are we going to acknowledge that we've abandoned it? Well, I think that um, probably, is this thing on? Yeah, no, it is. Uh, I think that probably my own personal opinion uh, is that once you accept intelligent design, a whole way of explaining things suddenly becomes much more questionable you have to deal with uh, 
what is the nature of this intelligent designer. And then you have to start asking questions about if it is God, which is uh, not that far off from uh, the kinds of demands that are being made on the designer. Somebody who can conceive of trilobites, presumably for the first time, uh, and starfish and um, whatever else in the Cambrian explosion and just make them happen, as apparently made life happen in general, um, is, is a being that is, well, let's put it this way, orders of intelli uh, an order at least of intelligence better than us. It has taken us this long to simply be able to copy the designs we have, let alone to invent new ones. Um, and once you have that kind of designer who has A, the capability, and B, the demonstrated will to impose those kind of designs on his creation. Uh, I don't view him as a tinkerer so much as I view him as a gardener. Um, but, um, but once you have somebody who will interfere in, uh, uh, in natural history in the way that has been done, then the intentions of the intelligent designer become much more important than what we would normally call the laws of nature. Because obviously this person can do things that apparently the laws of nature left to themselves in, in the present don't do. So once that happens, uh, then you can't use science in quite the same way as you used to. Um, and I think that at that point, there is one further question that is important, is how long did it take? And if you answer that question in terms of short age, then at, this, at that point, you're looking at some kind of a flood model. You're looking at some kind of a you know, creation that's in the recent past. Um, and in fact, uh, I'll specifically invite you, because you'll be interested, when we get done with this, uh, a couple of our other regular guests have asked, um, well, if we establish intelligent design, then what? And we're going to try to then follow this book with uh, an epilogue. Not necessarily one that Stephen Meyer approves of, but an epilogue from a uh, conservative Christian Adventist point of view. But it seems to me, and this, I, I, I would um, enthusiastically support this approach and, and would love to be able to um, follow with you what, what your proposals are. But remember, you put up there on the screen uh, the um, piano key uh, stripes of um, alternating magnetic. Um, you're looking there at uh, something that uh, is interpreted, I think, by everybody who looks at it as the fact that as the rocks came out from the central magma uh, channel that they hardened <coughs> and in the course of hardening preserved the magnetic orientation of north and south. And then when the, the pole shifted, then the rocks that came out preserved that and all the way out. Now, when you look at that, um, you're saying, okay, uh, science has in fact produced uh, some, some findings here. And those findings suggest that um, the Earth's magnetic pole has shifted many times and, and the, uh, the rock in the, in the bottom of the ocean has recorded that. You're using science, materialistic science, if you will. There's, there's nothing to do with intelligent design here. But you're using it as part of your argument that there are things that are not explained by regular science. And I think you've got to do that. So. The question, I guess, that I have is I don't think any of these people would accept a short chronology. I'm not sure about that because I don't know too many of them. But to the extent that they don't accept that and we're accepting part of what they accept, it seems to me that it is incumbent upon us to specifically say 
how we can do this. Which part of, of straightforward interpretation of scientific facts, like the alternating magnetic stripes, are we going to accept? Because if we do, then we've got the time problem that you've just mentioned. But I, I will follow this saga with great interest because I like intelligent design. I think, I think it's got a lot going for it. But the reason that I like it and you like it and everybody else likes it is because it does explain a whole series of scientific observations. And it may well be the best explanation. But what do we do with the ones that it doesn't explain in terms of time? That's, I think, where the rub comes. But we shall see as we go forward, I guess. Well, um, uh, we will we'll work on that. Uh, I agree with you. I think that um, uh, that's one of the things that we have to we have to work at mm -hmm. is uh, uh, if if you're going to go full fledged uh, uh, creationist, then I think that you have to you have to work on uh, the uh, the evidence that people use for arguing for long ages. It's the time question. Yeah. Um, just a minute. Go ahead, and then in the meantime, we'll pass the mic up here. Uh, just want to, to mention in connection with uh, this idea of the uh, magnetic reversals has been criticized. And it was criticized at the beginning. Remember, geologists questioned it at first, and uh, uh, it is not as firm as it appears at first, although I would not uh, say it is not uh, something that is of concern. Uh, it, uh, when, when this came out, and I remember going to the paper, the leading paper that pointed this out, it looked very impressive at first, uh, especially when they made black and white uh, patterns from those curves that you saw, and you saw both diagrams here on the mm -hmm. uh, yeah, on the screen this morning. So on, uh, uh, there are uh, questions about this, uh, and uh, the raw data is not as impressive as uh, textbooks pictures. Uh, but I, I would say, uh, uh, of questions, it is a question of time. Uh, there aren't all that many scientists who are working on one side of the issue. You have perhaps, you know, at least a thousand times as many scientists interpreting nature uh, without uh, a designer as those trying to interpret it with a designer. And so uh, the literature is tends to be heavily biased in that direction, and it keeps this in mind. But uh, when you start looking at the data, uh, we're not without uh, some data that is hard to answer unless you do believe in the biblical model. And I talk, I'm speaking of simple things like the rates of erosion, uh, residual carbon-14, paraconformities, and uh, you know, incredibly widespread formations out there that uh, so help me. You, you don't have to go out there very <laughs> long before you realize hey, that, that something very different happened here. It's totally out of character with what's going on at present in terms of the laying down of these sedimentary layers out there and so on. Uh, this, this is, uh, you know, uh, the few people who've been working on this, you know, uh, do suggest that, hey, uh, uh, if you have a broader approach to the thing, uh, you can come up with some different uh, uh, conclusions. Um, not you're, you're not uh, uh, state, stating that exclusively. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's a closed case at all. Uh, but one has a definite, I think, honest uh, scientific choice to make. Uh, because we have data on both sides of the issue. Uh, there, and then uh, back to Brian. I'd just like to <clears throat> ask Dr. Bull to explain a little bit more. Uh, you're saying there's an incompatibility between belief in intelligent design and flood geology. And I think you're trying to explain that with the magnetic lines, but it's not at all clear to me why there's a connection there. 
uh, unless it's just uh, because we accept a certain definition of science, uh, I, it's not at all clear. Could you explain a little more? Sure. Um, I was just simply going along with the evidence that Stephen had cited, and he began by saying that um, uh, fossils found on the west coast of Africa uh, match both in type and in the in the quarries that they're found in, fossils match uh, the, that are found on the east coast of South America. In fact, when we get to that, I'd be happy to bring, I have a very nice specimen of two mesosaurs uh, that came from South America, and the only other place they are found is the west coast of Africa. It, it's the combination, he mentioned that the, these fossils are located on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, and this was one of the things that, that was puzzling geologists for many, many years until the whole notion of tectonic plate movement came up. When that came up and it became obvious that there was a central spreading rift, then I think everybody, I suspect even flood geologists agree that the Atlantic uh, Ocean is a fairly recent phenomenon. Well, these are the kinds so, of... Certainly, um, uh, certainly Baumgartner, I think, would agree yeah, with you. Yeah, uh, Baumgartner was here, and he, he said it opened up over a fairly short period of time, maybe 100 years or something. Uh, those are the bits of evidence that these people are using, and as I say, I don't think any of them are flood geologists, and it seems to me that we're heading into an, an, a region where we may well agree with their conclusions, but we're going to put some other stuff on top. Uh, would you like me to bring, t tell me when you're going to discuss this and I'll bring my, my mesosaur fossils. I'm very pleased with them. They're, they're, they're beautiful fossils and my pro one of my prized specimens in my fossil collection. <laughs> I've looked for them for years. Okay, well, you get email. Yeah. Let, let, me, know, let me know when you want me to bring them. It's, it looks like a male and a female talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, th those mesosaurs would be interesting, uh, interesting anecdotal material, but um, if we agree to certain events, you can, you can see in geology often events that happen. doesn't tell you anything necessarily about when they happen or how, how they happen uh, in terms of ultimate cause. Ultimate cause. It, takes a, it takes a uniform uh, definition or philosophy of science, uh, it seems to me, to say that those are incompatible with intelligent design. Well, I, don't, I don't think they are incompatible with intelligent design. My only point was that I don't think any of these people believe that flood geology is, is sufficiently powerful mm -hmm. to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, but, that's, but not a, that's not an explanation for anything, whether they believe in them or, or not. Ah, but when, if, if in fact, they don't. We need to be honest and say we are using evidence from a group of people who don't accept a major premise that we have worked on for many years, and we are taking some aspects of what they believe, but we're ignoring other aspects. And I don't have a problem with that, just so long as it's clear that that's what we're doing and we acknowledge that they wouldn't support our position in flood geology. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, Steve Meyer is, has made it pretty clear that as far as he's concerned, uh, millions and billions of years are real time. Um, Jonathan Wells hasn't said uh, nearly as much, so I'm not sure where he stands. Um, I, uh, Michael Behe is uh, standard geology as well. Uh, let's see, who else is there? Uh, uh, William Dembski. If he could figure out how to do the geology in a short time, would be a short age creationist in a heartbeat, but he has not gotten there. Uh, Philip Johnson is kind of, um, I think he's torn. I think his head is in the long age and his heart is in the short age. Um, uh, Paul Nelson, although he doesn't have all the answers, is in fact, frankly, suspicious that short age is the right answer after all. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I think if you were to pin him down and say, well, what does the evidence show? He would not say that the evidence is mostly on the short age side. <coughs> um, but, well, 
again, it comes down to, remember, if there is a God, then knowing what God mm -hmm. said, knowing what God uh, wants to do or can do and so forth, becomes more important than what natural forces are. So, you, you know, once you cross that bridge, you're in a different country, and the rules are slightly different. Not completely different, otherwise we wouldn't have medicine. And we've got science. Yeah. We've got to contend with that. Uh, we need to keep in mind that this intelligent design movement developed not primarily because of scientific data. It developed primarily because of the principle of separation of church and state. Uh, and when the Supreme Court ruled three times that you cannot teach creation in public schools, then the people who wanted to advocate uh, the truthfulness of creation cre created concepts like uh, uh, scientific creationism and uh, where they could try and include the data in favor of creation into textbooks, into the classroom. And then, of course, Phil Johnson came along and said, okay, we we'll, we'll just let's have intelligent design. We're going to leave creation out of the picture here and we're going to see if we know we can't legally have intelligent design uh, included in the scientific curriculum. So th this is, uh, th the history of the thing is uh, because of all these court actions that limited uh, the possibility of creation. You go, well, why not redefine creation as scientific in various ways? Uh, that didn't work so well, so I, well, Let's just have intelligent design here without creation. And so, so uh, there's been that strong influence and, you know, some of the European countries, they don't understand why it's such a big battle about intelligent design. Uh, they all think, well, yeah, sure, there's been a uh, type of thing. But when we have this separation of church and state principle here, and you won't allow creation to be taught in the public schools, then you try some other ideas. I'm not. I, I'm not sure that's an entirely fair reading of the of the history. Um, as I read, until uh, Philip Johnson, who arguably started intelligent design, he had been a, a person who uh, believed in standard uh standard time scale and standard uh darwinism and everything and then this, well he became a christian so then they, you could allow for god i guess that helps but then started looking at the evidence and felt like the evidence for darwinism was extremely weak and that I think strategically he felt that Darwinism could be attacked without having to take on everything at once. Um, and I, I do know that there are a lot of people who will, will argue that this is really what's happened is that, I, I think that it's probably fair to say that a lot of people who used to be creationists latched onto intelligent design because it was the easiest way uh, to beat what they saw was the enemy. Uh, but the leaders, of the, the leaders of the movement didn't come to, I mean, for example, um, Steve Meyer himself came to this after having somebody introduce intelligent design that had nothing to do with short-age creationism. And, and, and to this day, he's not a short-age person. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of these people uh, in, who are the leaders. Uh, didn't start out as uh, as creationism creationists who backed off. I mean, if that were the case, then you'd see a lot more people like Paul Nelson in the movement. Um, I, I think that what's happened is that people have realized that. Uh, 
if Darwinism can't fight against a, another theory and has to support its own weight, it's in huge trouble because you can't get there from there, uh, from here with uh, the assumptions that they make. And the more we've studied it, the more obvious it becomes that that's the case. And if Darwinism has to actually defend its own theory instead of being able to attack everybody else and be the last person standing, that uh, that it just can't can't support the weight, and intelligent design becomes a reasonable alternative. Uh, but I agree with you. I think that it's really important for us to stop and say, okay, let's supposing intelligent design is correct. We have two really really nice books. This one and Signature in the Cell, arguing that for two events that obviously happened sometime in Earth's history, whenever it was, uh, the origin of life and the origin mm -hmm. of the Cambrian fossils, that Darwinism simply is not adequate and that most of the other substitutes <coughs> for neo-Darwinism aren't really adequate either and that intelligent design obviously can explain that. Let's just, in other words, instead of doing just the argument to design, we're going to do the argument from design. Once we accept that, what happens? And I think it's a really important uh, uh, statement. And frankly, I think it's one of the reasons why the argument to design is so vociferously opposed, is because people realize that once you get there, uh, the divine foot is in the door, and uh, the rest of the divine being will shortly follow. That's right. The camel's nose is under the tent, to use a, a slightly different metaphor. Mm -hmm. Anyway, next week we'll be discussing a little more about this. Uh, those of you who are interested are certainly welcome to uh, come and... Uh, Hopefully it will be as lively as it was today. And uh, we appreciate everybody who's come. Um, and those of you who don't get the emails, uh, let me know and we'll make sure you do. Those of you who do, uh, it'll all be announced. So come on back next week for the, the second installment of Intelligent Design Proper.